Having established the general theological background for the positive presentation of confessionally reformed theology regarding the person and especially work of Christ versus modernism um, in, that, in that Christianity and liberalism mold of Machen. We need to take an additional step forward as we survey the great debate today and consider Van Til's appropriation of the confessionally reformed Vossian enrichment that you find in Voss's seminal work, The Pauline Eschatology, which Van Til quotes extensively and seeks to develop. The next movement then in understanding the development in the great debate today is that through the work of Voss especially, enriching, not replacing, confessionally reformed orthodoxy, you find a distinctive philosophy of history that after the fall centers the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ as the second and last Adam, the life-giving spirit, and the man of heaven. And the text that's especially central for Voss is 1 Corinthians 15, 45 and following. And Van Til makes an additional claim. Not only does he cite and seek to develop this theology, but he, he argues further that under the influence of Kantian dimensionalism that modernists and Bardian theologians embrace, they cannot affirm programmatically and without equivocation Jesus' bodily resurrection in calendar time history as the central or centering event in the history of special revelation. And so it's not merely all of that background that we developed, but it's now especially the centrality of the resurrection of the last Adam, life-giving spirit, and man of heaven over against a different philosophy or conception of history that Van Til's going to develop in the great debate today. So this is kind of the second main structural strand for this positive presentation. Now, Van Til, quite explicitly, page 170 of the great debate today, roots his own positive understanding of the centrality of the resurrection in Gerhardus Voss's Pauline eschatology. He says, it is of, uh, page 170, it is of particular interest for us, as we conclude our discussion of the great debate today in this chapter, that we note how inextricably Paul's teaching on eschatology is interwoven with the general principles of his theology. In his book, The Pauline Eschatology, Gerhardus Voss says that, quote, to unfold the apostles' eschatology means to set forth his theology as a whole. Reversing this statement, we may add that one cannot set forth Paul's theology as a whole without indicating that his eschatology is its climax. The entire structure of Paul's theology may be said to be Christ-centered. Everywhere and always, Paul proclaims the self-attesting Christ. By his coming into the world, Christ has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. It is thus that Paul's eschatological motif is built into his Christology. He says again on page 175, he says, In such works as the Pauline eschatology by Gerhardus Voss, the theology of Paul, and the eschatology of Paul based on his theology is set forth in great detail. Obviously, Paul's theology expresses the significance of the person and work of Jesus Christ as portrayed in the four Gospels. Paul sets forth the significance of Christ from his coming into the world to save his people from their sin to his leaving the world with the promise of a new heaven and the new earth in which righteousness will dwell in all comprehensive fashion. Paul gives his readers an all-inclusive teleology of history 
and an eschatology which forms the climactic expression of his teleology of history. And Van Til says, moreover, in light of Voss's work, in his famous resurrection chapter, Paul introduces Christ as the second or last Adam. Christ is the inaugurator of a new mankind. The first man became a living being, the last man a life-giving spirit. He says, quoting from Ritterboss also, summing up the matter, we may say that Paul's kerygma of the great eon of salvation that has come in Christ is primarily controlled by the death and resurrection of Christ. It is in this fact that the present age has lost its power and its grasp on the children of Adam and that new things have come. It will therefore appear that the entire unfolding of the salvation that has come in Christ constantly reaches back to his death and resurrection because all the facets in which salvation manifests itself and all the names by which it is indicated are in the final analysis nothing else than the breaking through of the kingdom of God in the present world. The death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ are the central content of the gospel, the death and the resurrection. Now, in order to help you grasp the deep structures of Paul's understanding of eschatology and the resurrection of Christ as the last Adam, I want to give you a brief survey of what Voss says about Adam as the image of God, the first Adam. In other words, if we're going to understand this uh, centrality of the resurrection, we're going to have to understand 1 Corinthians 15, 45, that if there is a first Adam who is a living being, there is a last Adam who is a life-giving spirit. Verse 45, if, if verse 47, if there is a man of the earth, there is a man of heaven, 47, 47a, 47b. The, that contrast in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, between the first Adam who became a living being, 45a, who is the man of the dust, the man of earth, 47a, is set in contrast to the last Adam who became life-giving spirit, 45b, and is the man of heaven in 47, earth and heaven. That contrast is critical. Now what I want to do by way of summary is help you understand Voss's theology of the image of God and the covenant of works before the fall as the background for Jesus as second and last Adam raised from the dead. And I'm going to work Voss's Pauline eschatology into this presentation. Now, for those of you who have heard this, I'm going to give a very compressed summary of a section of a lecture I gave in 2018 at the Reformed Forum Conference. Let me walk you through just the basic Reformed confessional doctrine of image and covenant as it pertains to the first Adam. These are basic things that must be affirmed in order to affirm the centrality of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. First, the image of God, according to Reformed theology, consists in natural religious fellowship with God under covenant. Voss, in Reformed Dogmatics 2, 12 through 14, observes that the image of God entails natural religious fellowship with God. Adam needed nothing added to him beyond the image endowment in order to have fellowship with God. Secondly, as the image of God, Adam was entirely inclined toward God in mutable but true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. 
He had no inherent tendency to sin. In Genesis 1.31, he's created very good. In Ecclesiastes 7.29, he's upright. By inference, in Ephesians 4.24, he was created in righteousness and holiness. And by inference, in Colossians 3.10, that image consisted in true knowledge of God. Adam, as created, was given positive and original knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. There was nothing inherently defective in him that grace needed to overcome. Third, and key for Voss, the image endowment itself was eschatological in nature. It was designed to advance from the estate of innocency on earth to the estate of glory in a new heavens and earth, a heavenized earth. There was an intrinsic potential to consummate built into the image of God. And that means, as Paul interprets Genesis 2-7 in 1 Corinthians 15-45, and this is, the, this is central to Voss, if there is a natural body, a natural image endowment, then there is a spiritual body, a spiritual image endowment. Here is Voss's comment on Genesis 2-7 as interpreted by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Quote, The apostle was intent on showing that in the plan of God from the outset, provision was made for a higher kind of body. The abnormal body of sin and the eschatological body are not so logically correlated that the one can be postulated from the other, but the world of creation and the world to come are thus correlated, the one pointing toward, forward to the other. End of quote. That's the Pauline Eschatology 169, note 19. Paul's argument there, as Voss understands it, is that the mere existence of the natural body, when Adam was formed as body and soul from the dust of the earth, the mere existence of Adam as created entails a built-in provision for a higher kind of existence. To use the language from Westminster Confession 9, 2, and 5, the estate of innocency entails an estate of glory, the potential. 1 Corinthians 15, 47 expands it in this way. If there is a man of earth, then there is a provision from the outset for a man of heaven. Adam's indirect access to God on earth was designed to advance to direct access to God in heaven, the invisible heavens of God's dwelling place. Put in light of 1 Corinthians 15, 49, if there's a natural image that brings into view Adam's fellowship with God on earth, then there is in that image, in a provisional form, the potential for permanent fellowship with God in heaven. Finally, fourth, the endowment of this dynamic and eschatological image of God was the distinct terminal work of the Holy Spirit. When God breathed into Adam the breath of life, he not only conferred upon him provisional, mutable, earthly life, but built into Adam as the image by the breath of God was the provision for a higher, more glorious life beyond probation in heavenly Sabbath rest. But the question from the reform standpoint is this. How does Adam, as a creature, attain this eschatological potential? that's built into it. What does he need in order to advance from earthly probationary fellowship with God in Eden to confirmed fellowship with God in heavenly Sabbath rest? There's a single word answer for that in classical Reformed theology. It is covenant, the covenant of works. And let me make four corresponding points to what I've said about image that brings this out. 
And this is to help you understand the, 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 es- the necessity and centrality of the resurrection stems from, a, from a, the deeper Protestant conception of image and the covenant of works. So, so hear this. First, in taking this in a somewhat different order, God condescended in the covenant of works, Westminster Confession 7.1, to realize the inbuilt or inherent potential to consummate in the image endowment. The natural image of God without anything super added was created to advance from probation to rest. And the covenant of works, special terms of the covenant of works, are given by God precisely to advance and realize that potential. The inherent provision of the spiritual and heavenly, inherent to the image of God, that inherent provision can find its realization through obedience to the revealed terms of the covenant of works. As I've said before, image without covenant and covenantal terms is blind. Covenantal terms without image is empty. Obedience to the positive terms of the covenant is the path in life from fellowship with God under probation to fellowship with God beyond probation. Life with God under probation to life with God beyond probation. From indirect access to God on earth to direct access to God in heaven. That is the advancement covenant offers image-bearing Adam. Second, covenant holds forth to Adam the prospect of being confirmed in that advancement. So it's not just an advancement with no confirmation. It's confirmed and irrevocable advancement. Adam being entirely inclined toward God in knowledge would be confirmed irrevocably upon condition of his obedience. His righteousness and holiness confirmed irrevocably upon condition of perfect obedience. The covenant holds forth to Adam the path of ascending beyond earthly probation into irrevocable Sabbath rest in the presence of God. Third, it is the natural communion bond given in the act of creational image endowment that will be advanced by that covenantal obedience. Adam, naturally in fellowship with God, will advance beyond probation to see his glory. After his creation, please hear this, Adam needs nothing infused in him, added to him to have fellowship with God. So its consummation is what? a full actualizing of what is built into him as a creature. Adam's not going to become something other than what he is. He's not going to be uh, deified above his nature. He's not going to be reproportioned to the essence of God above his nature. What is going to happen in consummation for Adam? The natural religious fellowship is going to be fully actualized, fully consummated, and his fullness as a creature in natural religious fellowship with God, will be brought to its full, climactic, eschatological fruition, where God will be his blessedness and reward. There is therefore, listen, an organic relation between image of God ordered to heavenly beatitude and the fruition of that image reaching heavenly beatitude. The natural communion bond with God in Eden is designed by God to advance organically to glory. Nothing super added, nothing ontologically reproportioning about it. Fourth, if the Spirit confers on Adam a natural communion bond as the image of God, the same Spirit will perfect that communion bond in consummation. If Adam obeys the terms of the covenant, the Spirit would elevate him to heavenly glory, enabling a direct vision of the triune God, the perfecting of the already existing fellowship bond in heavenly glory. This would be the work of the Spirit's agency, advancing Adam's estate 
without reproportioning his essence to participate in God. Now, why do I say that? Please hear this and note this well. You can even pause and reflect on this. The only backdrop for the centrality of the resurrection, as Gerhardus Voss sets it forth in the Pauline eschatology, is that doctrine of the deeper Protestant conception of image and the covenant of works. It is that theology that Voss says is set forth in the first Adam becoming a living being and the man of the earth and the image bearer before God. And it's just in light of that that Voss says we are to understand now the resurrection of Christ as the last Adam, the life-giving spirit, and the heavenly man. 1 Corinthians 15, 45c tells us that the communion bond has been advanced by the breathing of the Spirit a second time in the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the last Adam, life-giving spirit, and verse 47, as the second man of heaven. Christ himself as the last Adam has brought the natural communion bond to its consummation in the Spirit, and he has advanced to the glory of heaven. In his ascension into heaven, Christ receives that second breath of confirmed life and pours that breath out on his church, forging her in his image. Put expansively, it is a spirit-wrought restoration and consummation of covenantal communion that dawns in the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the last Adam. And it is in that event that redemptive history reaches its climactic point. Pentecost, in grand scope, means that the fruition of Christ's obedience is the Spirit himself in heaven, Acts 2.33. First for Christ as ascended, and then for those united to the ascended Christ by the Spirit and through faith. It is in Christ's exaltation to the right hand of God in heaven, whereas the Messianic Son, he is filled with the fullness of fellowship with the Father. Psalm 16.10 and Acts 2.28. It is there that the covenant of works finds its fulfillment. As glorified, he knows the personal presence of the Spirit of God who brings consummation of covenantal fellowship that Adam lost in the fall. This is the substance of Voss's contribution. If there is a spiritual body, then there is a, uh, if there is a natural body, if there is an earthly man, then there is a spiritual body, then there is a man of heaven. The eschatology of the image of God entails Adam was created to advance beyond Eden. The eschatology of the covenant of works entails that he could have attained that advancement. Now listen, because here's the key. It is in this covenantal logic alone that you can affirm the centrality of the resurrection in the way that Voss affirms it in the Pauline eschatology. Jesus Christ, as the representative head of a new humanity, rises from the dead, the first fruits of one great resurrection harvest, and in his resurrection, in his life, the church rises with him and in him. This summarizes the positive theological view of Voss that Van Til cites, commends, and advances and presents as the Reformed view. Now, it's just that, or, and really that's a bare summary, but it's just that bare summary that Van Til has set forth. So, added to what we've said before, 
This confessional orthodoxy is enriched by Voss's theology of the centrality of the resurrection and the two Adam scheme. And we've come to the place now where we're going to make our first grand contrast with the, from the theology of Voss, as Van Til presents it, applied to a species of modernism represented by Rudolf Bultmann and his program of demythologization that carries with it, listen, a distinctive conception of history that carves out a distinctive meaning of the significance of resurrection, to which we will turn as we study the contrast of Christologies in the great debate today.